I V M. Folks, welcome to Paisa Paisa. I'm your host Anupam Gupta, B50 on Twitter, and this is the ESG Investing Special. Really, really, really thrilling because. This is such a new concept. This is such an interesting concept. Okay, ESG guys. So ESG, it's a style of investing, and it stands for Environment, Social, Governance. Okay, and to explain all of this and why it's important, I have with me Deepak Kurana. Deepak is a Proposition Sales Director, Sustainable Finance, and Lipper in Asia Pacific at Refinitive. I love this name, Refinitive. I like Definitive. Deepak, welcome to Paisa Paisa. Thank you so much for doing this for our listeners. Let's get started. Right. Two things. First. Tell us about what exactly is refinitive, and then we'll go to the concept of ESG. Uh, thanks for having me, Anupam. Uh, I'll try to answer the question in two parts. Uh, firstly, I'll briefly touch upon uh, the background of uh, refinitive, and thereafter, we'll briefly explain the concept of uh, ESG. So, on the first part, uh, we refinitive are a global provider of uh, financial market data and infrastructure. Uh, we provide information, insights, and uh, technology that drive uh, innovation and performance in uh, global financial markets. Uh, we enable uh, the financial community to trade uh, smarter and faster, overcome uh, regulatory challenges, and uh, scale uh, optimally. The company was founded in year uh, 2018. Uh, Thomson Reuters sold 55% majority stake of its uh, financial and risk FNR unit. Uh, to Blackstone Group on October 1st, 2018. Uh, the deal valued the total financial and risk business at about uh, USD 20 billion. Uh, this business was formed into Refinitive. Now the company is jointly owned by Blackstone Group, uh, which has a 55% stake, and Thomson Reuters, uh, which owns a 45% uh, stake in the company. Uh, we have an annual ten- turnover of around uh, USD 6 billion. And serving more than 40,000 institutions in around uh, 190 countries. Uh, one important- so if I've so sorry, sorry, sorry. So if 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 I've if I've if I've gotten you right, you are the guys who provide the entire market data and much more, of course. That you know, say brokers, asset management companies, all of them use for their analytics of the market, of companies, of global assets, commodities. Am I right in that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we, wow. yeah, across all asset classes, we have a length and depth of uh, data available with us. Please, please, please. Yeah, please and go uh, also specifically to this subject, uh, sustainable finance, ESG, we are the leading provider of sustainable finance content and information globally. Our solution includes uh, company ESG data and ratings, country rankings, basis, sustainable development goals prescribed by UN, fund ESG scores, sustainable finance league tables, uh, sustainable finance, uh, you know, uh, across, you know, uh, you know, length and breadth of solution we have got in this. Coming to the second part of the question, the concept of ESG. So in simple words, uh, ESG stands for a combination of three building blocks, environment, social and governance. So ESG means using E, S, and G building blocks to evaluate companies and countries on how much progress they have made with the sustainability. And uh, sustainability is the ability uh, to maintain the provision of value-adding services uh, without compromising the ability of others, including future generations, to meet uh, their needs. Uh, ESG are the range of key risks and opportunities that are increasingly acknowledged as important elements for uh, companies' long-term performance. So at the bottom line, uh, it's the non-financial information that has material implications on the financials of uh, companies. Uh, One important point, ESG is not meant to reduce uh, the return of an investment or uh, limit the investment universe by excluding bad companies. Uh, ESG is rather meant to enhance the long-term return and help investors to evaluate companies more effectively. So back to you, uh, Anupam. Sure, very interesting. Um, so if I if I have understood this right, you know, ESG in India is still relatively new. Right. I'm pretty sure that it would have started much earlier, uh, say in developed markets like US, Europe. Can you tell us about the background and history of ESG? Where exactly it started? How it got popular, both from global perspective and in India? Right. So I'll again try to break uh, the question in three parts, Anupam. Uh, First is background and history. Second, uh, how it became popular 
uh, globally and the third specific trends in asia so talking about the first part the background and history uh, the basically the roots of esg goes back to a socially responsible investing sri is the term that is generally used where the companies with irresponsible practices for factors e and s were excluded from the investment considerations the first instance of sri dates back uh, 200 years where a holy club movement protested against investing in companies that made weapons tobacco a similar movement took place in 1960s in the light of vietnam war the difference between sri and esg lies in the fact that esg based investing is considered uh, to make financial sense rather just sticking to the ethical consideration which is the case with sri uh, the esg concept came into the light with the un pri report of 2006 which consisted of fresh field report and the forum who cares wins so the term esg was first used in the letter uh, the forum who cares wins and highlighted the esg criteria must be incorporated in financial uh, evaluations uh, moving to the second part how esg became popular the multiple reasons uh, for the strong traction for uh, esg a uh, government across the globe are emphasizing to consider esg risk especially climate as a fiduciary duty for uh, institutional investors that largely includes asset management firms and asset owners pension managers and all so currently an epic wealth transfer is taking place from the baby boomers to the millennials uh, millennials worry about climate change get outraged by companies bad behavior and uh, prefer to work with ethical companies so uh, going forward uh, the investment industry is expected to actively align their products uh, with preferences of this specific investor segments the millennials so far it was you know hnis you know you know institutional investors where the focus has been but going forward millennials are also going to be the central uh, focus of uh, asset management firms and also the growth of passive management is putting active managers under cost pressure they need to generate alpha to uh, in order to justify the fees uh, so one way to achieve this is to include additional insights such as esg uh, into the investment process to outperform the benchmark and few other points like consumer demand reputation risk for companies are also enabling uh, esg push uh, so these are the few points that highlight the rationale behind the strong traction for uh, esg uh, and the growing acceptance of esg can be seen through numbers as well the pri forum uh, the you know principle of responsible investing uh, in the forum now has 2500 plus members uh, representing assets worth over usd 100 plus uh, trillion so which is kind of a sizable number uh, assets dedicated to sustainable investments have grown at 11% cagr since 2014 a consistent you know growth we have seen and uh, the growth is expected to be uh, similar over next few years as well that's the projection that is made by multiple research firms uh, the aum of self identified esg fund is ex- expected to contribute close to 36% of global aum by uh, 2020 so some very exciting numbers you know to support the growth uh, story of esg and the third piece uh, specific trends in india i'll make some quick comments for asia as well as uh, you know in addition to india piece uh though uh, esg is more prominent as you uh, alluded uh, to your, uh, your earlier uh, during the session uh is more prominent in us and europe it has gained traction in asia and india too um, some governments like hong kong and singapore in the region are taking the lead uh, to promoting esg as part of their economic growth agenda a uh, chinese regulator has made it mandatory for all asia companies to disclose esg related information we have uh, japan pension fund gpif the world's largest pension fund has put esg at the heart of their investment strategy so uh, very exciting trends and india too uh, is beginning to witness some uh, action in this space as we know sebi uh, in india asked the top 1000 companies to disclose uh, esg details as per business responsible uh, reporting brr framework so this is a uh, you know the indian standards indian uh, disclosure framework for disclosing uh, in, uh, esg information prescribed by sebi uh, we call it brr uh, firms like sbi mutual fund 
they have integrated uh, the ESG research in the core investment process. We have seen uh, quantum SBI access have taken a lead in rolling out ESG theme funds. Firms like DSP, Aditya Birla, Kotak, ISSA Prudential, BNP Paribas, they've already filed their offer documents with uh, you know, SEBI for uh, approval of ESG theme funds. So some, some good traction for ESG in India as well. So this is uh, the brief on the points that you made, uh, Anupam. Uh, back to you. Sure, sure. I, I wish I could go into a discussion about how the purpose of a corporation itself has <laughs> changed. You know, there was a time where uh, traditional finance theory would say that the purpose of a corporation is to maximize uh, investor wealth, shareholder wealth, corporation wealth, whichever you know yeah. version that you that you look at it. And now, obviously, shareholder has been replaced with stakeholder. Right. And once you say that the purpose of a corporation is to maximize, you know, or rather to to benefit all stakeholders, then of course the entire absolutely uh, the entire pool changes. So let's go into that deeper. Yeah. E S G. Now E is for environment, S is for sustainability, and G is for gov. G is for governance. Right. Can you just walk us through each concept? What you know? What exactly it is to our listeners? Right. So I think I'll give you some examples for uh, E S and G factor. So let's look at uh, E pillar. Uh, you know. So from our E pillar uh, standpoint, the broad category, the you know, resource use could be looked at, and within resource use category. People tend to look at uh, the sections like energy use, water use, and how the company engages with its uh, suppliers. Uh, we could also look at the broad categories like emissions, uh, within emissions, you know, areas like carbon emissions, water discharged, how the company is managing its waste. Uh, so that's also one of the few of the points you know uh, could look we could look at while understanding e pillar. Uh, talking about uh, the broad category like innovation within the e side, so there we look at uh, you know uh, how uh, the company is spending on research and development activities. Is the company investing in activities that promote uh, environment friendly products or reduce uh, animal uh, testing, etc.? So, so uh, these are the some examples you know to kind of better understand e as a pillar. Now uh, let's look at uh, you know social pillar. Uh, within this, we could look at the broad category like workforce. You know, within workforce, people seek answers to issues like how does the company engage with its uh, employees. Uh, this does include policy with regards to employee well-being, option of home of office, diversion from you know you know day-to-day -day work, you know some you know uh, quick breaks. And uh, within S, you could also look at uh, you know broad category like human rights. In this, uh, you know, uh, the focus is on avoidance of forced labor and uh, child labor. Uh, within a broad category community, you know, within S, you could look at how does the company engage within the community where it operates? What kind of a donation does the company make? And within governance pillar, you know, you could look at, uh, you know, pillars like, you know, your parameters like management, which includes various aspects of the board. For example, composition of the board. Uh, shareholders, which includes uh, shareholders' rights, whether shareholders have a say in executive pay or electing uh, directors. Uh, you know, you could also look at CSR strategy, which includes is the company following any guidelines? Uh, does it report on sustainability? So these are few, you know, some you know uh, examples and you know way to further understand uh, E and S and G uh, factors. Uh, back to you, Anupam. Uh Thanks. Thanks, Ivo, for that. So here's the thing, right? I mean, you know, factors of, in, there are so many factors of investment out there, whether it's momentum, whether it's value, whether it's growth, ESG. In the end, if I look at it from, of course, a slightly limited perspective of investors, right. you know, say people who actually believe in, uh, in ESG. So there are a lot of companies out there that actually are are not ESG friendly and they also land up, you know, if you just look at their stock price, they also land up giving good returns. So if I'm only interested in investment returns, you know, as say, whether it's an AMC or whether it's any investor, why does it become important for us to consider the ESG cr criteria before making an investment? Yeah, I think uh, a very pertinent point, uh, uh, Anupam, uh, you know, end of the day, people are looking for returns, right? So, uh, 
you know, while ESG, you know, it's a great concept, but eventually the bottom line is, you know, how much money you have made, you have made on your investment. So I think uh, let's just stick to the same point of, you know, performance. So there are a lot of research studies, I think, done recently clearly indicates that the ESG integration helps improve the long-term performance of the company. So I think we also need to understand that the corporate world across all industry, not only the financial industry, is fundamentally changing. Uh, ESG is exposing lots of risk for uh, companies and at the same time, uh, you know, a lot of opportunities for uh, uh, investors. To cite an example of a couple of examples, uh, if you are a business uh, uh, in a location which is exposed to ecological or physical risk like flood, earthquake, your supply chain will be impacted in case of any adverse event. Uh, another example could be the regulatory changes, which is happening in U, uh, Europe specifically a lot. Uh, you know, the regulatory changes around carbon emissions may require you to make fresh capital investments in your manufacturing unit. So the whole technology uh, stack or, you know, the manufacturing unit that you have needs to undergo the revamp. So that would expose your business to a transition risk. So all such risk impacts the long-term performance of company and uh, uh, needs to be accounted for while making investment decision. So we all know that the short-term or past performance is not the barometer for future performance. So if you need a stable investment with better long-term performance and lower volatility, ESG is your answer. Back to you, Anupam. Very interesting. Yeah, very interesting, Deepak. I want to ask, you know, I have a follow-up here because I want to understand this right. I'm going to give you a hypothetical scenario, okay? Um, Let's say that, and now that ESG is a fairly large factor with a fairly large amount of funds following it, uh, let's say that in the developed markets, US, Europe, where there are pretty strict regulations. If a regulation changes out there, which requires ESG funds to, you know, uh, to ensure that the companies comply by certain regulations, say in labor, okay, that they can't employ lab- labors of a certain age, et cetera, et cetera. Would that have an impact in India? You know, you have a global ESG fund who is actually, who holds, say, XYZ company out. And it turns out that that XYZ company might be complying with Indian law, but is not in compliance with the global norms. Theoretically, what, how would this play out? Yeah. So, uh, I think uh, f- let's just first understand what's going to happen to uh, the fund in uh, US. So, you know, if there's a change uh, in the regulatory, uh, you know, requirement, definitely the fund needs to align to the, you know, the regulatory, uh, uh, re- you know, uh, sort of guidelines from the regulator there. And, you know, accordingly, they need to structure, uh, you know, their portfolio. Now, and then let's see what's going to happen to the company here in India. So eventually, the India is uh, the the company here in India is going to have lesser traction from uh, foreign institutional investors. So that means that they have uh, you know a lower access to the capital now. The the good equity money which was flowing into the company earlier that's not going to be available. So I think that's the point we need to understand. So uh, India companies they have quite a bit of exposure from uh, uh, for. Uh, financial institution investors outside India. And uh, if uh, the Indian companies, they want to raise money from overseas investors, they need to now start moving towards better ESG standards. Uh, You know, so I think we all know that, you know, there are few firms, they have already listed their ADRs. There are few firms who also kind of go and access uh, bonds, uh, money through bonds, like through green bonds and all. So if you need good access of capital, uh, then you have to, you know, comply with, you know, better ESC standards. Back to you. Very Anupam. interesting. Yeah. yeah, very interesting. Looks like this, you know, this is not just a trend, but it's actually going to change the way, like you said, you know, the access to capital that people have. Okay, so folks, that's a wrap on the first half of this episode. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about real stuff, you know, that how do you invest in ESC companies, you know, per, and what has been the track record of everything, you know, of, of the ESG companies in real life? We're going to talk about a lot of data here, a lot of ways that you can actually uh, refine your strategy and include ESG in your investing as well. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. This is the ESG special with Deepak Khurana, Proposition Sales Director, Sustainable Finance and Nipper, Asia Pacific at Definitive. We'll be right back. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. 
It's been an absolutely incredible week on the network. We had so many great guests, so many great episodes. Advertising is dead. We had Faye D'Souza on. It Varun took a break for four weeks, but what a bang he's back with. Siddharth Deshmukh celebrates the 100th episode of The Traveling Professor. It is a amazing show, which I cannot say enough good things about. Please, please do listen to it. And a different Siddharth on the network, Siddharth Bhatia. He's just been like absolutely guest after guest, right? This week, Zoya Akhtar talking about Gully Boy. I couldn't imagine a more interesting conversation. Ragini Kumar is on two different episodes this week. She is on Cyrus Says and she is on Edges and Sledges, both in anticipation of her new show, Zindagi Diaries. Do check out her appearance on both of those shows and her new show as well. Tanvi and Shloka, the Millennial Athlete, had a phenomenal episode with Dinesh Karthik and Abhishek Nair. Absolutely riveting stuff, talking about mentorship in many different ways. Definitely do give that a listen. And finally, I have a request to all of you. We have our listener survey going out this week. Every year we send out a listener survey at the end of the year. We're doing it again this year. And we would really, really, really appreciate your help in letting us know a little bit more about yourself. Our advertisers are really keen to find out who's listening to us and more about them. Anything that you could do is kept anonymously and we would really appreciate your help in this. And to sweeten the pot just a little bit, we'll be giving a randomly selected group of participants in the survey some Ribium swag. Last year we gave out coffee mugs. What we're going to give out this year is still a surprise. So please do help us out. We'd really, really appreciate that. And with that, let me get you back to your show. And welcome back to this really special ESG special episode of, of Pesa Vesa. My guest, Deepak Kurana, Proposition Sales Director, Sustainable Finance and Lipper, Asia Pacific at Refinitiv. Refinitiv, guys, like we said in the first of, of, of this episode, is huge. Okay, These guys are specialists on the ESG side. First up, we spoke about concept of, you know, the concepts of ESG, how it applied abroad and in India. Now let's get to the practical stuff. Deepak, what are the ways of investing in ESG companies? Great. Uh, I think, uh, thanks for this question. I think, uh, important one. And uh, I think we need to move towards more of a standardized approach. Uh, as of now, this kind of a fragmented approach is taken by different players. So let's just, you know, look at what all is being done in the industry. Uh, so there's no best way to do uh, ESG integration. So therefore, integrating ESG invest, uh, factors into the investment process should be done in a way that best fits each individual firm's uh, schemes uh, of things. The set of common approaches and best practices that are seeing uh, you know, acceptance among the large number of market participants, such common approaches are uh, you know, exclusion policy, uh, active ownership, uh, ESG aware, uh, norm-based exclusion, uh, ESG integration in a fundamental way, and uh, the best in class. So let's just get into the, these individual approaches. The exclusion policy excludes uh, investment sectors uh, that are conflicting to the investment criteria, such as um, avoiding weapons or tobacco stocks or investments in countries with the poor human uh, rights records. Uh, outside of these uh, excluded uh, categories, investors apply a standard uh, investment approach as usual. No changes to that. Uh, in active ownership, uh, the institutional investor seeks to uh, uh, influence companies on many different levels. Uh, uh, investors can uh, take an engagement approach where uh, they monitor the ESG performance of companies and engage in constructive shareholder dialogues to ensure proper progress. Uh, a consulting approach is a form of engagement where larger institutional investors and shareholders are able to pursue quite a diplomacy. Uh, here, basically, the investors mainly attempt to influence the company through regular meetings with the top management, exchanging information and developing a trusted advisor relationship. When your stakes are higher, you tend to basically get into a consultative sort of a mode here. And uh, in ESG of aware approach, right? So where, where you just kind of, you know, applying ESG, you, you know, you as an investor, you know that you need to look at ESG as a factor. Uh, in this, uh, you know, investors recognize the positive contribution that ESG considerations can make uh, to the investment uh, outcomes. Uh, this is a broad category and there's a, you know, varied degrees of incorporation of ESG elements in uh, investment decision. Uh, the, uh, the approach norm-based exclusion is a comprehensive type of negative screening uh, that excludes investments in companies that do not meet uh, widely accepted norms. Uh, such as uh, United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, Carbon Emission Standards. Uh, the approach of uh, ESG integration includes uh, the consistent fundamental analysis of ESG issues, 
in order to identify additional sources of risk and opportunity and deliver better uh, investment decision making in this uh, st- statistical models are used uh, to establish a predictive correlation between the sustainability aspects and uh, financial factors and the last one in the best in class approach it's a pretty straightforward investors rank the potential investment options basis their uh, esg performance and select the best performers so very interesting yeah so back to you on on sorry yeah. yeah very interesting i am you know maybe at a at a retail level one fine day we might even have an esg etf here right uh, for retail investors to invest in or maybe an esg fund i don't india i don't think has an esg index right so et, etf to we i do think have, it's a long way no, so we do have we do have, we do have. there's a index which is offered by uh, a bsc there's a uh, uh, index offered by uh, uh, you know so nsc as uh, nsc they have one and bsc with the in uh, in the partnership with snp they have one so a oh. couple of indices and in fact we at uh, referentiv also offer a you know uh, esg based index for india market very interesting so then it's probably just a matter of time for people to um, you know for funds to start a tracker right. which in fact is the last question that i have for you deepak what's the track record out i i know that refinitive tracks csg seriously in a lot of depth across a lot of parameters so you would have all the data a lot of products walk our listeners through the track record on csg you know yeah. that to me is like the final bottom line right so uh, the disclosure from uh, you know fund companies on esg integrations are st- uh, still evolving uh, so we currently do not classify investment products in the investment strategies as explained uh, in the earlier question uh, however uh, we've done multiple back testing for esg performance at a company level and also at a group of funds level right so broad you know creating a basket of uh, you know esg funds so let's just get into these individual uh the two back testing the broad categories of back testing that we have done uh so let's start with the company part first so to give you some perspective on companies back testing on esg performance uh we recently engaged a research firm with the name of probability and partners to analyze uh, the relationship between esg scores and financial return for large firms worldwide so idea was to kind of keep it very independent a third party research firm looked at the data the data of our esg scores for companies and their uh, respective performance so the research highlighted that uh, you know high scores can actually have a a positive impact on the financial returns of the companies though uh, there are regional variations with some regions faring better than others specifically during the covid-19 pandemic uh, firms with high scores recorded lower financial losses compared to firms with the uh, lower scores so that's something which is important so it helps you to protect your downside as well uh exploring the relationship between esg scores and uh, financial performance data went through mainly two steps the first one was to you know uh, seeing correlations between uh, you know firms esg scores returns volatility and market value and then secondly a broad data regression model was implemented to observe uh individual companies uh, you know through time and uh, esg scores to explain stock returns uh correlation uh, correlating rather uh, esg scores returns volatility and market value resulted in two key themes uh, across all regions uh, within the analysis correlation between esg scores and market value were positive and significant for the period of 2010 to 2018 across all regions so this indicates larger firms exhibit better esg performance because uh, they have more means and resources to invest in sustainability and therefore they are able to improve uh, their scores correlation very interesting so yeah yeah i was just going to say positive correlation means that higher ecg or uh, sorry higher <laughs> health health angle out there sorry guys yeah. esg right higher esg scores yeah. means higher market value creation from 2010 to 2018 that was a positive correlation right yes so basically two two things you know it helps you you know getting you a better performance and also helps you protect your downside hmm. yeah very interesting right. so that, so that so, you know that's once you've got a positive correlation between an esg factor and market value i think 8 years is fairly uh, is a fairly long period uh, to analyze and so serve i mean the the sample size was quite large i'm sure absolutely right yeah yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So uh, quite a, you know, so around 10,000 odd companies that we have in our uh, coverage, uh, you know, broad universe was looked at. Lovely. Yeah. So I think uh, I just want to quickly make uh, some, uh, you know, before we get into our individual products, we were actually on the sure. earlier point of uh, performance. Hmm. So specifically, I want to make some points on India. And also, you know, the uh, the performance trends for the funds in the form of a basket. Uh, so specifically looking at India, uh, MSCI India ESG leader index, you know, uh, outperformed uh, MSCI's uh, broad market index, which is MSCI India, by almost 200 basis points over last uh, 13 years. Uh, so, so ESG investing in India certainly delivered, especially during the downturn in uh, 2008, 2011 and 2015. A better performance. So clearly indicated a tilt towards quality and so low volatility as well. So we are having some sort of, you know, back testing, some prudent, uh, you know, uh, you know, effective results for Indian markets as well. I just want to touch quickly touch upon the, uh, the outperformance of funds, right? So uh, just I'll quickly spend a couple of minutes there. So as and when we think of, you know, ESG outperformance conversation, it's always, you know, good, uh, I think, prudent to talk about broader fund market, how they have fared. So over the first half of this year, uh, through the ups and downs of the markets, uh, we see that about 47% of the managed uh, funds, they were able to beat their technical benchmarks. Uh, and at the end of uh, first quarter, these numbers were even more muted uh, within, you know, with only 45% of uh, funds outperforming. Uh, compared to for, uh, 55% underperformance. So quarter two actually has given some bit of improvement uh, in terms of outperformance. Now talking about the ESG outperformance. So here in contrast uh, to conventional fund managers, ESG managers actually have more outperformers than underperformers with you know 56% besting their technical indicators over the first half of the year. And similar to the conventional peers, they had a better uh, quarter two as they too raised the average from 56-46% split to, you know, 56-44%. So, you know, ESG as such, you know, the managed funds as well, they have, you know, done better than, you know, the plain vanilla funds. Uh, and also within India also, while the track record is limited and there are only the three funds as of now, which I think altogether amounts to around 4,500 AUM. So this trend is picking up. And once we have a longer track record, we'll be able to see a, you know, a clear trend, a broad trend in, in this space. Uh, so this was more on the, you know, the outperformance that ESG as a concept has seen across companies, across funds. Great, Deepak. So fine, final question, you know, we've, you've shown how ESG can actually be a pretty good factor when you compare it to equities. Tell us about the various products that Refinitiv has and how can our listeners reach out to you or more or know more? Yeah. So uh, as I, I think earlier mentioned, uh, we are a leading provider of uh, sustainable finance content uh, locally here in uh, India as well as, uh, you know, uh, globally. Uh, you know, our solution includes uh, company ESG data and ratings. So individual companies are being rated, are being scored by us across different uh, ESG measures. Uh, we make this information available to institutional investors to kind of create their, build their portfolio. At the same time, we could also make it available to, uh, you know, uh, wealth firms, you know, the firms that run investor platforms. So they could actually, you know, make this information available to, uh, to public at large and they could benefit from this very powerful information to kind of shortlist companies for their investments. We also have uh, country rankings based uh, basis the sustainable development goals prescribed by UN. So when, you know, uh, uh, global asset managers, when they're, you know, kind of allocating money across multiple uh, countries. So uh, these country rankings at times are really, very helpful. We also do fund ESG scores. So like, you know, the company ESG scores using the fund holding data that we track at our end, where we have recently rolled out the fund ESG scores. So, you know, within India, we cover around 700 uh, odd funds, which are receiving, uh, you know, uh, you know, ESC scores from us on a monthly basis. Again, a tool for uh, you know wealth management firms or individual investors to you know uh, to shortlist funds for their investments. We have uh, sustainable finance leak tables, uh, sustainable finance deals data that's more suited for uh, you know uh, investment banking firms, the firms that are interested in tracking you know uh, sustainable finance uh, capital raising activities. We also have uh, you know stuff like uh, ESC portfolio analytics wherein 
uh, large asset management firms they can build their portfolios can analyze uh, the port the the full portfolio the integrated portfolio in a more of a uh, f- from the esg lens you know so in the, the entire portfolio coming together and they could see what kind of a carbon footprint the whole portfolio has instead of just looking at one company uh, we also have esg news we also do carbon pricing research uh, we also do uh, sentiment based you know so the uh, the information the the solution that i touched upon earlier that's more of the fundamental data which is disclosed by firms we also have you know artificial intelligence based uh, sentiment uh, scores for uh, indices for esg parameters again that's more of based on uh, uh, the social media you know the professional media what they're talking about companies on esg issues basis that we kind of create certain indices so a plethora of you know very holistic solution that we've got uh, you know happy to engage with the market participants for the needs sure sure so folks uh, there you go uh, you know this is really very interesting discussion on esg and the fact that it actually works so deepak gives some a lot of data about how how esg creates value correlations and all and all of the stuff if, if you're interested the website is refinitiv.com i'll spell it out for you r e f i n i t i v and that is a wrap on this esg special on paisa paisa my guest deepak kurana proposition sales director sustainable finance and for asia pacific at refinitiv deepak thank you so much for being our listeners my pleasure anupam thanks for having me thank you and listeners if you like this podcast don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the ibm network You can listen to us on the IBM Podcast app or ibmpodcast.com. You can also follow us on our social media. We are IBM Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. If you want to reach out to me, I'm PPP on Twitter. And thank you so much for listening to Pesa Pesa. No material on the show should be considered as financial advice. The material on the show is for informational purposes only. Please consult a financial advisor before taking any investment decision. Are you looking for India's most awesome cricket podcast? Are you now tired of listening to the same old guys drone on about cricket everywhere? Edges and Sledges is a weekly cricket podcast hosted by three fans of the game, Varun, DJ, and myself, Ashwin. It was established in early 2018, has over 60 episodes now, and is of course now proud to be on the IVM Podcast Network. Each week, we get together from three different time zones: the USA, the UK, and Singapore, and we talk about things from the world of cricket with a focus on Indian cricket. We often interview special guests from all around the world, including former cricketers and cricket media personalities. So check out Edges and Sledges, the cricket podcast, now on the IVM Network. Namaskar. This is Ashish Vidyarthi. Yes, my friend, these are challenging times, but in these challenging times, we can create something extraordinary. Do take time to listen to my podcast, Begin the Journey, available on the IVM Podcast. website app or wherever you listen to podcasts remember we have a great opportunity called life cheers